Welcome, everyone, to uh, this session at the ORASIS uh, Global Meeting. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Lehmacher. I'm an operating partner at Anchor Group in Hong Kong. Anchor Group is an investment and new business model development firm a bit far away from uh, the topic of this session, uh, transforming us into digital beings. Uh, but uh, I have very... Uh, uh, distinguished speaker who have uh, uh, great ideas about what it means uh, to become a digital being or not. With us today is Ralph Belusa, Chief Digital Officer of Hapak Lloyd. He calls in from Hamburg in Germany. Uh, Patrick Kovac, uh, President, SME and Entrepreneurship, uh, Entrepreneurship Committee Business um, OECD, uh, calling in today from Budapest. Uh, and um, we have also with us uh, Kamales Lardi, Chief Executive Partner, Lardi and Partner Consulting, calling in from Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, Joao Simoes, Chief Executive Officer, Idea Space. Um, and he uh, is with us, joins us from uh, Portugal, from Lisbon. And Hidetoshi Uchiyama, Chief Executive Officer, Unary Japan, uh, joining us from Tokyo. We are also waiting for Betty Kumaho, Founder and, Party and Managing Partner, the Cobalt Partners um, uh, based in Ghana. Uh, we hope that Betty can join us at any moment. Our topic is very exciting. Uh, it's easy to introduce such a topic um, during an online uh, conference, in fact, because that is the manifestation of our world. But what does this mean for us? Are we really here today or how real are we? How does today's meeting differ from the ones we have joined before 2020? Or how do we feel about all that and how do we feel our our participants and our um, uh, audience. Uh, what is the impact of digitization? That's, of course, at the center. And I would like to open the discussion with the question, uh, what, in fact, excited you to join this conversation? What drove you? And what are your your initial, initial thoughts? And... Uh, Kamales, if you can take the lead here. Of course, it's a pleasure to join everyone here today. And um, it has been a pleasure actually getting to know each one of you. Um, for me, I think I'm a, a technology optimist. Um, and I'm a kind of a futurist. When I think about technology, I'm extremely positive about the impact that technology could have, digital technologies across the board in our lives. I've seen uh, firsthand the impact that it could have across many different industries in creating a more just society, a more um, a fair society, a society that has more accessibility um, and more almost equality across the board, um, you know, leveraging technology to gain access to things that you wouldn't normally get access to, um, things that might be um, potentially, you know, that for physical boundaries could create or the physical environment could create boundaries for us, but technology then transcends these physical boundaries. So for me, I've seen a lot of impacts uh, in this area. For example, financial inclusion is a big topic, an area that I work in as well, where you have, you know, about um, 1.2 billion people across the globe, if I'm not mistaken, who are unbanked at the moment, who don't have access to traditional financial services. And with mobile banking, as well as, you know, new blockchain solutions that are coming in place today, you get more access to financial services, but as well more access to um, the wealth management that traditionally people who don't have a certain amount of wealth wouldn't get access to. If we talk about healthcare, just in the past one year, the developments that we've seen within healthcare, utilizing technologies to gain access uh, for people in remote areas to gain access, for people who don't have accessibility to gain access to these uh, traditional healthcare functions, as well as if we look at, um, you know, 
we, what we're seeing today is utilization of augmented and virtual realities to allow surgeons from across the globe to, to provide assistance and to do remote surgeries for people who don't have uh, the traditional financial uh, capabilities to get these top of top of the line surgeries and so on. So I think these are creating a more just and equal world. Um, I see a huge um, benefit for for um, different societies across the globe, not just the developing world, but also the underdeveloped um, regions. But I think with anything in life, uh, we have to see technology or digital technologies uh, from a balanced perspective, right, in moderation. So it comes with the good and it comes with the bad if it's utilized in the wrong way. So having the right frameworks in place, having the right values, human values, as well as the right intentions and the right people involved, a diverse set of people involved in creating these solutions. These are going to be the differentiators in terms of how we can gain value from technology. Fantastic. A very enthusiastic statement uh, for the opening, and uh, but also some thoughts about uh, prerequisites to make that work in the long term. Ralph, uh, how do you see uh, Kamala's comments and what is your view on the transformation of us, in fact? Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for being here. And Kamal, as you mentioned, that uh, also I can echo that it's really that technology really support us human. And for me, it's really important to make that clear. Um, uh, people matter first. People can be creative with the support of technology. So people, creativity, and technology for me really matters. And um, with that in combination with lifelong learning, with a positive mindset of, of using that technology, helping us to be better humans. I think that's for me at the core, really to help to make everyone every day a bit better with the help of technology, without the help of technology. So in combination, and that's why this is also at the Horasis, a super great um, opportunity to connect to people, to, to speak to people, as we see that here from different continents, uh, exchanging our ideas here with the help of technology, uh, always with the help of technology currently, even if we go by, by train or plane, uh, talk to each other. So it's really, in my heart, is really helping everybody to make everybody uh, every day better with the support of um, technology to be then also transforming us to a bit more hybrid um, personalities, digital beings, but in the end, hopefully also better humans. Thank you very much, Ralph. Um, I would like to ask Toshi, uh, Japan is very advanced, uh, but also has a, uh, an unusual, but uh, as I very, uh, specific demographics with a lot of uh, people at a higher age. Um, how does uh, the technology impact life in Japan and how do you see uh, the transformation? Okay, um, nice to meet you all. Um, uh, before answering your question, let me explain what my company does. Uh, my company is the largest location-based service platform in Japan. Uh, of having uh, 100 million users, uh, lo the location data of 100 million users. Uh, now, the, because of COVID-19, our data is now utilized by government and a lot of retailers at this moment. And uh, regarding the, your question, uh, I want to raise raise um, an issue from two points of the inconvenient truth, such as Al Gore. <laughs> the one is that uh, in, still in Japan, the e-commerce ratio against the, the overall consumption is less than 10% still in 2020, meaning that most of the consum consumption is made in the real world. The, but it, the real world is not well digitized yet. So still in 21st century, we receive a lot of real advertisements such as flyers and direct mails if I go back to my house. Is this still a 21st century? So that's one issue. The second issue is that each person sees more than 300 advertisements a day. I counted. <laughs> I counted. So meaning that um, it's 
obviously the uh, information overload. And uh, I researched in, on the internet and the, that number was 500 in 1970s, meaning that uh, information that people receive every day is increasing out in, in rapidly. So, um, so my view is that we need to think about or develop some kind of way to predict the each, what each, per, each person, each consumer wants and each consumer doesn't want, then maybe we should some new, new kind of way to provide the real-time notification service based on that kind of AI or predictions. That's what I'm thinking. Thank you, Toshi. Um, Chuao, you are very much in the innovation space. You think a lot about data, monetization of data. Toshi made a point about 100 million uh, data points. Um, so what is your take uh, as probably also a technology enthusiast? Um, in what direction are we heading? Okay. Uh, in my view, uh, I, I'm going to try to give two perspectives. One as a businessman, uh, another one as a human being, right? That's why the, the, the topic of this discussion, transforming us to digital beings, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm still a bit old school, okay? And I, I really, truly appreciate the physical contact, the, close, the, the getting closer to, to the people, right? So all these non-verbal communication that we all have, um, even now, we, we are seeing explained to people here, it's not the same that we could be seated on the same physical space, right? Um, so in that sense, I think technology is good, is here, is our future, uh, but technology for me is not the problem. It's a, it's a, it's a, well, it's the good itself, it's, it's properly used, right? It's the culture and the values that are the people that are coding and using the data behind it, right? So like Yoshi was referring, now we are flooded with information. A lot of, of our information, uh, how we behave, um, especially in, in more specific countries, uh, uh, they have a more aggressive approach. Uh, the, 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 uh, well, they don't take they don't take care about the privacy and the, uh, the uh, of the people and individual. Uh, so for me, it's not like the right of being disconnected. Okay. Uh, and now we don't have this advantage unless you fully disconnect from the world, right? Even on our mobile, uh, all the information is being captured, it's being flooded through your eyes and, and it's being collected for someone to monetize or to control some way who you are and what you do. So having said that, my view is that uh, first, my concern, this, uh, even the, the pandemic, and I'm sorry if I'm losing because of uh, the, the flow of the conversation, but even this pandemic shows that technology, if properly used, can help us and, and be, uh, instead of glo a global market, we, we have a global world connected and people can work from everywhere. And this is, and this is one of the big advantages. Without technology properly used, we couldn't do that. But uh, having to the, uh, to the ground, I think we should be careful more about how you dehumanize these this, um, this relations uh, between people by forcing too much the technology, right? So digital beings for me is like uh, pieces of software. And I don't, I don't want to be a piece of software, okay? And, uh, and that's the, 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 the main struggle that I have. Of course, there are some pieces of software that can replace me on, on some activities, but I don't want to be framed into a, a, a piece of software. That's, a, that's the main message that I would like to, to share. Thank you. A great, a great message, uh, Joao. And Patrick, you are also uh, looking, at looking at the topic probably from a business perspective. Um, but um, we are also curious what you you think about that as a human being. What's your take, Patrick? Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Well, I think to talk about this topic, we need to understand what's really happening outside in the world. Um, 100 years ago, when people were writing science fiction books, they were uh, suggesting that in the 2000s, we are going to go around with flying cars. And it's not happening, right? 
But why? Because digitalization is exponential. And 100 years ago, we started from zero, 0 0.001 and so on. But uh, two decades ago, we reached one. And now the technology is exponentially growing. One becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. And now this accelerated growth is something which is challenging us as humans. Like our parents or grandparents cannot even use the remote control uh, on the television. And now our children are born and they can uh, really use the iPad. Now our phone's computing capacity is uh, much bigger than the Apollo program's uh, spaceship uh, full computing capacity, which, which went to the moon. So basically, now we reached a critical point where the acceleration of the digitalization is really exponentially growing. And we human need to upgrade ourselves also and, uh, and keep up with this change in uh, different kind of uh, technologies like uh, like the personal computing in space technology in healthcare the 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 shift is so fast that there are even psychologists who are basically dealing with this topic to getting people ready uh, to be able to handle this speed so i think we need to really uh, grab some strong points we need to grab into our humanity and be very careful in the next two decades in order to be able to use and not to be used by the technology. I think that was something I, uh, Kamal has hinted to. And uh, I'm now curious to hear from Toshi um, how the Japanese society is upgrading, considering that a large portion has reached uh, a certain age. How, how do they navigate this situation and uh, how does the society help them possibly to upgrade? Okay, the, regarding the Japanese um, situation, we are not coping with this um, digitalized society yet, meaning that uh, Japan is now, now we, I, I think that Japan is now undeveloped country in terms of the digitalization. But, um, as you know, the Japan is the high age society. Uh, aging rate is 27%, which is obviously the number one in the world. And now the higher, the people of higher age are forced to um, adopt the digital tech, the digitalization. Now the 70, the age of 70s are now using smartphones. So um, they are, um, what can I say? Um, now they are buying the, the consumer goods every day, so through smartphones. So now I think in, in Japan situation, now we are in, in, in developing every day. Yeah, Toshi, and, and I think, Joao, you brought up an interesting point. What is the digital, the digital human? I don't think that the idea of the panel was... Uh, to convert us into software. Um, I think it, it can be seen from that point of view, and it's definitely an interesting way mm -hmm. of looking at it, uh, because the virtual human could be also a topic for a, a panel. Um, but uh, I, I think what we are talking more about is how do we as humans deal with the technology? And... Uh, we brought already up uh, certain points, uh, and uh, aging population is one because the adoption uh, is more difficult there. So, in fact, we need more, Patrick, I think, exponential technological development to have better interfaces uh, for uh, certain groups of the society. But, Kamalis, you also spoke about divides, right? There could be uh, divides across society, the divides across the globe, the global north versus the global south divide. Um, can you elaborate a bit more about that? Definitely. Before that, can I just pick up quickly on something that Toshi and Zhao mentioned earlier? I think there's, um, you, you know, we tend to often think of technology as either or. So we are in a space where Toshi mentioned it's a very, very um, crowded space when you talk about the digital environment and it's very difficult to stand out. It's There's so much going on at any one time and we are almost overloaded um, 
often with how much stimulation we get from the different types of technologies. And Joe mentioned that it, it is, um, he'd rather have these physical contexts. And I think this is something that we deal quite a lot with when we create technology solutions for um, organizations and for businesses. Basically, we're not in competition with the, the digital or physical space, but what we're doing is we're going into the kind of hybrid digital environment, which is the digital physical environment. And I think they come very much in combination. And the way to stand out in this very busy digital space is really to create human experiences that really add meaning and value. That's where we should be focusing. The technology element, it's just an enabler. It's enabling us to do a lot more than we imagined before but it's truly an enabler, right? So if we talk about um, the, the digital divide, I think there is, um, you know, I, I've seen data that shows people are adopting technology almost as quickly as we're developing technology solutions. So the adoption of, um, of people, the society is a lot quicker than businesses or even what regulators can keep up with. And this technology adoption happens though in certain pockets of society. So uh, in developing nations, for example, uh, in Europe, you have more than 90% internet penetration rate. You have um, smartphone, about 96% smartphone penetration rate in Switzerland alone. But if you think about the African region, for example, less than 29% of the region have access to the internet. And in some parts of Africa, there are countries where they have less than 5% of the population gaining access to the internet. And this, this for us today is almost a basic necessity, right? To be connected, to be online. So I think oftentimes we forget when we talk about technology solutions, we're looking at um, the developed nations, we're looking at people who have these basic accessibilities, basic access to the internet. One of the things that I've developed is a blockchain solution for the agriculture industry, for palm oil specifically. And we were quite surprised when we went, we built this blockchain platform, a mobile app and solution, and we went down to certain plantations and they don't have 2G connectivity. And they have harvesters who are walking around with these old Nokia phones. So we had to build SMS interface to the blockchain. So I think we oftentimes have to keep in mind there is a massive digital divide. What's happened over the past year with COVID is this digital divide has increased. We find often we're talking a lot about um, online um, education, you know, students having access online and so on. There are a massive number of people, even in the U.S., who don't have access to online studies. So we need to think about how can we make technology accessible? How can we close this digital divide that exists in different parts of society? Yeah, when I when I think about divides, uh, I would also like to know from Patrick, uh, you are um, dealing with SMEs, right? This is one of your your area of focus. Uh, is there a divide between SMEs and large companies? Yes, there is a very big uh, divide. That's why we even have an initiative with the OECD called uh, D for SME, which is pushing the SME digitalization. Well, if we come to the corporate world, digitalization equals productivity. And the micro and the small companies are not able to digitalize as fast as uh, the larger companies. If you have three employees, you need to work. You cannot afford to buy expensive software or you don't have the mental capacity at the end of the day to think that what kind of system to install or you cannot simply afford to send two of your colleagues out of the three person working in your company to, to learn to handle some kind of pro uh, program. This was the situation, but uh, the only positive thing in the in the coronavirus uh, coronavirus crisis is that seventy percent of the SMEs worldwide um, launched some new kind of digital solutions uh, out of necessity. Now our job is to keep this uh, keep this uh, speeding up and to keep this uh, on the track because this is really uh, could help and benefit the smaller companies. So. Basically, um, especially if you are if you are a small company, then uh, then you can even substitute labor labor force. You can even even be more productive. And without, for instance, digitalization, you cannot really be um, like in a supply chain of a larger company. So basically, uh, it's very important to help the micro and the small and medium companies to to um, speed up because uh, there is an unfair advantage uh, for the larger companies because they can be more productive with more money 
And uh, really the backbone of our societies are the corner shops and the SMEs, which are producing uh, two thirds of the labor around the world and basically 99% of the companies in uh, almost all the countries. Thank you very much, Patrick. And Betty, we are good to see you. And um, we are just talking about um, the differences between, uh, uh, let's say, smaller companies, larger companies, but also uh, the global north, the global south, uh, the more aged population, the younger. Um, in the context of, of Africa, how does the transformation look like? I mean, in Africa, it's the same as other emerging markets where we know that at least 70%, 80% of some GDPs is really the SMEs. So it's critical to the movement of the economy, but it's also very critical to solving people's problems. Um, and, and the way to do that is, is really technology, making sure it's technology enabled. That's our connector, um, and that's what enables people. Um, I thought it was interesting when uh, Kamala said earlier about the low sort of internet penetration within the continent. Um, and I think that what we find is that even the mobile phone and the ability for people to talk to one another is the way a lot of business moves. So you don't necessarily have to be connected to the internet to be able to leverage technology to have your small business where you're, you know, milking your your goats and selling it in the in the region. Um, so so SMEs really kind of leverage even basic simple technologies. Um, we're, we're we're still not at the point yet where we're necessarily thinking about blockchain, all of those things. But there's a tremendous amount that we can use to better our lives, uh, better our ability to support one another just by using very simple technologies. Thank you, Betty. And now, I also believe that uh, the pressure under which businesses, for example, in the global south are, whether it is uh, Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia or Latin America to add to other regions, uh, they force the people to, yeah. to adapt within the, the context of their means. And they are doing that very effectively I'm always uh, pointing out that it's not that the global north is more advanced. It's in fact that the global south digitizes in a very different way. And I think the both of you have, have uh, brought that out. Ralph, I heard uh, about the advantage the bigger companies have. Um, can you give us your perspective? Do you feel that it's easier for larger companies to adopt to the digital world and uh, you're also not independently operating so we talk about a larger ecosystem stretching across the globe can you give us your perspective yeah i think much sure so i think it's really a large corporation if they are prepared and if they are uh, have a modern setup to really scale the organization scale the work in the different countries and so on work close together with different departments not having silos and so on so then it's really scalable and working so you have then in large corporations you have i would call that more a hybrid organization a hybrid company between a large organization and a startup. And so um, a startup always have the problem, startup is on exploration mode and try to reach a certain amount of money and customers and then scaling to other regions or other countries and so on. Large corporation with a good setup in sales, marketing and IT. If this is working, they can scale that immediately in large regions. But as I see that currently, not many companies are really equipped to that uh, to scale really fast startup ideas globally in their whole organization or changing that. From my point of view, the thinking is if they sell today washing machine and building washing machines and tomorrow something else, normally in a futuristic modern ar company architecture, that should be possible. That's that's a bit my view on the different scaling methods between startups and uh, large corporates. And on the other side, what, what Betty meant, um, um, I would just elaborate shortly on that one because that's uh, also, from my point of view, it's really important how different uh, persons and regions and people are facing and working being digital. 
And I really like to work also with uh, colleagues from, from Africa to see how they are facing sometimes also difficulties and different kinds of things. For example, there is the load shedding app. Load shedding means um, if there is no electricity, you get a warning on your phone um, that the electricity will shut down in two hours. And also it's great to see that some of the colleagues in Africa, they say, I don't care if it's now off or not. I don't care. Once mentioned, oh, that's wonderful. Now I know in two hours I need to be at home to do the laundry and all that stuff. And so that's wonderful and great to see how positive people are getting um, with the technology, helping each other. And that's why I think it's a good way forward, not being anxious, learning the things, trying out things and being positive, what we can change for, for the good ones. And uh, therefore, the load shedding app, for example, is, is a wonderful example how we can learn and adapt it and share it. And not everybody needs to use that. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ralph. We have spoken about SMEs, about uh, different uh, groups of, of the population, continents. What about leadership? Um, because we have all that now distant work, and I, I don't address that question to anybody uh, in particular because I think everybody of you has an opinion. Um, is there a need for a new way of leadership and how uh, is leadership coping with the current situation? Koshi? Okay, um, I okay. I manage my company, but I want to. Uh, I'm I'm also a, a professor of teaching logical thinking in a um, business school, and uh, the one point I want to say is that we we don't want to be a part of a software like Matrix, as Joe pointed out, and uh, we have to be up uh, regarding the leaders. Leadership. We have to be updated, upgraded to a new generation to utilize computer for higher level of thinking. For example, of humans, physical thinking resources are limited. So that's why we have to prioritize the problem and solutions, right? But computers can solve all possible problems if, if human define issues and logic. So this is a hint. So if human defines issue and logic and computer solve problems, that this is called computational thinking. And uh, I think um, this will be very important in this coming ages of the new, data, new leadership. Thank you, Toshi. Joao, you were nodding a lot. Yes, my view. Of course, we, we uh, globally or in the vast majority of our global, we had a huge jump in terms of digit, digitalization. Okay. We see a lot of even the SMEs uh, introducing their ERPs and etc. to log. All good. The software is there, but the culture hasn't changed. So you can put all the technology you want if you don't change your leadership. If you don't change your your culture, you will just accelerate for the disaster because it will continue the, the same mode. I'm going to give you a concrete example. One of the companies that I'm involved, we have developed a platform that connects the car dealers with the, the finance bank, the, the, the banking systems. Okay, for the for the loan process, at least in Portugal, 80% of that process was manually done. Okay, with paperwork. Some of them, imagine this, still sending facts. Okay, so and we have launched this platform. So the technology is there. There are some. Uh, there are approximately twenty thousand car dealers in Portugal, seven thousand brokers, and uh, twenty institutions. For so some of them, the adoption was quite fast. They were, they have a very leaner organization and they immediately capture and they, they launch it and they are using it. The main resistance was the banking system. 
first, because they are concerned about sharing data. Okay, I'm having a request for financing this car. Um, uh, w w which competitors will provide the best offer? Because then I will have this information in my hands. Uh, and if I, I have an, 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 a non, a non uh, disclosure agreement uh, about the, the policies applied, I have the cheese in my hand and I could use it the way I can. Okay. But the, the adoption in this case was, so some of the, the smaller players, they adopt quite, quite fast. So the smaller banks, they, they immediately engage and they are already providing them the full digi digi digital platform. The others are, are pre presenting some resistance. Like why leadership style? Like why? Because people are not ready to have such fast adoption of the technology and they need to upgrade to be reskilled or rethink about how we use the technology for our benefit. Because yeah. just to give you an example, we can reduce a process of, I think it's, it, the benchmark was 72 hours between um, credit request and credit approval. Uh, uh, we can do it in five minutes. Thank you, okay. Joao. Betty, you raised your hand. I did. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about leadership as well, because it is key, I think, to keeping up our social contract and making sure that we're keeping up with the rate of change of technology so that technology doesn't surpass humanity. Um, and, and for me, I, I definitely agree that part of it is understanding the culture. Um, part of it is really sort of understanding the technologies themselves and how they can be applied. But a huge part that I've experienced on the continent of Africa is really making sure that you understand the context. If you don't understand the context, technology will not be applied appropriately to the situation. You miss, it just takes one small thing to miss uh, the right application. And I think technology itself we've seen has also some adverse effects. And if you're not tracking enough to kind of understand what those adverse effects are, you, you, you'll you also miss the boat. And so those things really require you to understand the environment. One of the examples I like to use to explain it is actually a non-technology example. And it is an uncle of mine who actually came to help his region of the country do family planning. And so they made sure they had the local language, made sure to take the women out of the their homes and ask for permission from the men. And they spent two days teaching them everything they knew about the pill. Um, they left and came back nine months later and the incidence of pregnancy and childbirth had gone up, not down. It went in the wrong direction. And they spent days asking the woman, what happened? Did you understand everything we did? Um, did you do what we were supposed to do? We did. And eventually they found out that when the women went home, they told their husbands everything about it. And the men said that, well, if anybody in this house is going to take the pill, it shall be me. <laughs> so all of that work fell apart <laughs> because of that context that the man is the head of the household and if anybody is going to take the action, it will be the man. <laughs> so it's really important that leadership also is close to ground um, and understands the environment um, and is tracking to that. Thank you, uh, Betty. Kamal, uh, any reaction? <laughs> I absolutely love that story. That was so cute. Um, Actually, what I wanted to add to, to the points that the other panelists have also mentioned already, I think, you know, we we develop digital business transformation strategies for various industries, um, companies of various sizes. We implement solutions for them as well based on technology. And I think it's absolutely true what Zhao said. It, it, culture and people can ruin the best laid plans and strategies um, if you don't bring people on this journey. And one of the elements that have been so important when you want to successfully transform an organization and create technology solutions is really finding this shared purpose. So when we define um, the kind of digital vision for a company, we try to also define a kind of a shared purpose within the organization, kind of a war cry or something that people can fall behind and believe in when you're implementing these solutions. And this has to be something that comes top down. So the leadership have to show an active role in terms of they believe this is the direction they need to go in. They believe this is for the greater good of the organization and they can translate this greater good to each individual um, employee in terms of what context it is for them, how it translates into their daily business and what the shared purpose within the organization is. And this can be incredibly powerful if it's implemented in, in a similar way. And I think coming back to what Rolf mentioned earlier as well, this startup mindset. Um, so getting leadership teams uh, to understand 
the startup mindset, right? So breaking down and working within small, nimble teams, uh, making decisions quicker and, you know, transforming or adapting new ways of working, being open to exploration, to new ways of doing things. I think this kind of startup mindset is really important if we look at kind of the corporate and SME uh, environment. So those were the two points I wanted to share. Thank you, Kamalis. And I heard also something from, I think, Joao said that uh, things can go worse, can become worse through technology. So technology has the, uh, let's say, the ability uh, to amplify in both directions, into the good and the bad. And I think that's something we should keep in mind. That also brings me to a point of which we haven't touched upon, which is governance, which is regulation. And uh, I would like to know from Patrick, working with the OECD, what's your take on regulating uh, digitization technology uh, so that we make sure that it doesn't amplify the things we don't want to be amplified, like uh, biases and algorithms, uh, but helps us to improve society and economy? First of all, let me state that uh, digitalization and digitization is something which are the government are putting a collecting effort and uh, they hope for benefit of mankind. I'm also a member in the Business 20 Digitalization Task Force and everyone is pushing for smart cities. So there's certainly very good aspects of the technology. But in the future, one of the, of the largest risk is, in, uh, is uh, artificial intelligence. The risk is uh, cybersecurity, uh, even as private person, even as small companies, the cy cyber threats and the cyber attacks are, are uh, growing and it's uh, showing a very scary number. And on the other hand, the people are very much afraid of, of artificial intelligence. In different countries and different parts of the world, the acceptance of artificial intelligence is, uh, is different, but there is still a big question. Uh, in terms of regulation, um, at uh, one of the OECD forum, I believe two years ago, we had a very big debate because we covered the, the fact that the, the, the digitalization and the technology is growing exponentially. So it's, it's really opening up. But the, the legislation and the policy can maximum grow linearly. So basically, the gap is growing between the technology and the regulations. What we saw with Bitcoin, what we saw with, with digital currencies, well, they were on the market for one and a half, two years already. People were doing uh, good things, bad things with it. And uh, out of the hundreds of countries, just a few were able to react and just at least understand the situation. And it's still unregulated in, in uh, lots of markets. Just think about uh, 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 digitalization, think about, uh, the, for instance, in the medicine or in the, in the different kind of fields. So basically, there is a danger that the regulations cannot really follow the speed of digitalization. So this is a risk. But on the other hand, of course, for instance, make cities livable. We, we will be, uh, need to use digital technologies, smart city technologies, and such kind of things. So it's a, it's a very a double-edged sword. We need to be very much focused at the moment, and we really much need to, need to follow what's happening. And this is a collective effort, and uh, we business people can do a lot uh, in this process. I have a final question, and this is only... A a uh, question where you can say up, it remains or it goes down. Uh, work from home after we are through the pandemic or have found a way to live with it, will it stay? Will it go back to what it was or will it even increase? And uh, I start with, with you, Kamalis. What's your, your take on that? Very short because we have not that much time left. Sure, I, I believe in the hybrid environment and I and actually that's one of the silver linings of the COVID situation. Uh, we've opened, you know, globally, the workforce has opened up their eyes in terms of what's possible with this hybrid environment. So I do believe that, um, you know, a certain percentage of time will be spent from a remote workspace, whether it's work from home or not, but from a remote workspace. And we've seen productivity um, not be affected as uh, what they had, you know, anticipated. So I think companies will be open to that. A uh, situation in Africa, how, how is the remote situation? Is it anyway remote? Uh, it is. 
uh, particularly in the cities. Um, we have a we have good technology connectivity here, so that works. But I believe globally we're social beings, um, and so I think we'll it'll decrease from where it is today, but it can't go back to where it was. Um, I think we've moved the needle. COVID has moved the needle towards uh, less connectivity, but we'll have to find more ways to be most continue to be social. Ralph, uh, your take. My short take on this is, as, as uh, Betty mentioned, uh, we are human beings and people who would like to connect, they will connect and invite colleagues from, from Hong Kong and from Africa, from Singapore and all over the world. So it's a mixed place in the future, but uh, I'm also more than sometimes to really met with real people and invite the other colleagues from the rest of the world. Ciao, very quick. No, I fully agree with what was said. I think that's a $1 million, uh, $1 million question, right? So no one knows exactly.